Hello, everybody. I'm James Malone. I'm a product manager on Google Cloud. And one of the products that I am product manager for is Google Cloud Dataproc. And today, I want to talk to you about uh, using the open source set of tools that are in the Apache and Spark ecosystem to do data processing on Google Cloud Platform. So we're going to talk about a few things today. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the tools themselves. They're great. They bring a lot of benefits, but they also bring a lot of complexities and headaches. I'm going to talk about how we want to solve that using hardware and software innovations that are a part of Google Cloud Platform. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and do a live demo. And we're going to create a pretty big Spark and Hadoop cluster to show you kind of what we can do at scale, some of the speeds and some of the tools that we have and that we bring to the Spark and Hadoop ecosystem. Um, and then from there, I want to share a bunch of really new, exciting things that we just launched uh, in preparation for Google Next. So the first thing that I want to talk about is the complexity of the Spark and Hadoop ecosystem. These tools are really, really great, but they often bring a lot of kind of painful headaches with them. So typically, when you set up a Spark and Hadoop cluster, it's not a sort of simple or linear process. If you are familiar with setting up a Spark and Hadoop uh, cluster on premise, especially, there's a lot of steps involved. You have to get your hardware and configure that hardware. But that's only step one. Once you have the hardware, you then need to get the open source bits. Sometimes you might do this vanilla, or sometimes you might use a Hadoop or Spark vendor like a Cloudera or Hornworks. But then you have to install that software and configure it, tune it. And only really after you're done with that are you actually ready to start processing data. Now, if you wanted to use Spark and Hadoop on day zero or day one, you're probably not using Spark and Hadoop on day one with this process. It's probably taken days, weeks, or months to actually get this working properly. There's even more headaches if you actually want to set up multiple clusters, maybe cluster for production, cluster for development. So the scaling makes your life really difficult. So say you start off with a cluster and you want to expand it because you ran out of HDFS space, which is used to store data in Spark and Hadoop clusters. Well, there's going to be a lag of time between when you have the capacity that you start with and have the capacity that you need. This also may require you to actually take your resources offline or have impaired functionality. Probably your business or the need to actually process your data is not stopping for you while you're actually scaling this cluster up. You're actually probably compounding patterns, and things are probably piling up that you wish you could get to. You also have to really babysit utilization. And this is a really big problem, especially for accountants. You're paying for a lot of capacity, but you're probably not running your big data infrastructure at 100% all the time. That means that you're probably paying for overcapacity. Conversely, you could pay for undercapacity, but that's not really a great solution either, because then you have less capacity than you actually need to answer any of your questions. So you have to really be very careful about how you plan out your capacity and try and smooth out your util utilization as much as possible. Ultimately, you're not paying for what you use. This is a really big problem. And one of the big complaints of the Spark and Hadoop ecosystem are their great tools. And oddly enough, a lot of it's free open source, but it can be very, very costly to run and maintain. We don't want you to have this problem. Spark and Hadoop are great tools, and they bring a lot to the table. But you shouldn't worry about the cost and complexity of running these tools to take advantage of them. So I did mention Cloudera and Hortonworks. Uh, if anybody in the room is familiar with Cloudera or Hortonworks or MapR and you're using them, uh, just to throw out, all three are supported on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, they all have different ways to bootstrap clusters. So there's things like Cloudera Manager or Ambari or uh, CloudBreak. If you want to use those on Google Cloud, you totally can. And you get a lot of benefits from doing that. You're paying. You're going to get uh, you know, low pricing for VMs. You're going to be able to use cloud storage. Uh, you could possibly use Cloud Bigtable instead of HBase. So there's a lot of benefits for doing that. So just to say, if you are tied to these or really love these vendors, you can definitely bring them and lift and shift them to Google Cloud Platform. So we kind of offer a suite of ways to run the giant Apache and Spark ecosystem. And that's maybe actually worth a note. So Apache and Spark are sort of the two most well-known components, but it's a really big ecosystem of kind of related tools. And I've never really found a better way of referring to it other than the Apache, Spark, and Hadoop ecosystem. So there's a lot of tools that you can run on these clusters. And we have a whole host of options to allow you to run the software on Cloud Platform. As I mentioned, you could take your 
uh, on-premise or other cloud Hadoop vendor and bring it to Google Cloud like a Cloud or Hortonworks. Um, we started off the journey with Cloud Dataproc by offering what we call BDUtil, which is a set of command line scripts. They're open source, and they're on GitHub. And they allow you to bootstrap kind of a lightweight Spark and Hadoop cluster. Um, some of our large customers actually started using BDUtil and have moved to Dataproc. But if you want to use BDUtil and get started with a kind of lightweight Spark and Hadoop cluster, you totally can. But with Cloud Dataproc, we thought we could do better. With BDUtil, you're still kind of manually setting up the cluster. There's still a little babysitting you have to do. It can be kind of difficult to submit jobs. For instance, you might have to use a command line to do a lot of these things. That might not be a problem for some users, but for your average business user, you probably don't want them to have to use an SSH window to actually, or terminal window, to go interact with Spark and Hadoop clusters. So with Cloud Dataproc, we really tried to do a little bit better and focus on everything except your data. So we take care of the infrastructure. We take care of the software. You bring your data and your jobs, and you can use Spark and Hadoop without worrying about too much else. So there's a lot of open source components, as I mentioned. And they map to different Google Cloud products in, in different ways. So a lot of these, uh, these products you can run on Cloud Dataproc. So if you're familiar with, Cloud, uh, with the Hadoop ecosystem, Cloud Dataproc uh, uses Yarn. And a lot of the applications in that ecosystem will run on Yarn. So if you're using them, you can generally come and use Cloud Dataproc. Uh, we also have other services that are in their own ways tied to some of these open source products. Um, and I'll get to how they're tied in, in a minute. Uh, but for instance, if you're using HBase, uh, you might want to check out Cloud Bigtable. Uh, if you're interested in Apache Beam or Crunch or Flume, Cloud Dataflow is a really great solution that you might want to check out. Uh, it, and additionally, if you're tied to things like Impala uh, or Sentry or HDFS, we have products that, that map to sort of all of these technologies. So Cloud Dataproc handles, I would say, the majority of them. But around the edges, we also have a lot of projects that can fill in the gaps. So I mentioned that these products were all inspired by open source technologies in different ways. Um, so a lot of the open source ecosystem is based on papers that Google has released throughout the years. So for example, uh, the relationship between Bigtable and HBase. Um, in other cases, the open source ecosystem has kind of evolved in and of itself. Uh, at this point, Google's also very actively involved in contributing back to that open source ecosystem, a great example being Apache Beam, which allows you to create batch or stream pipelines in kind of one language with one SDK and one model and run them on many different routers, whether it's Cloud Dataflow or Flink or Spark. So interestingly, a lot of the things that run on Cloud Dataproc were inspired by things that Google has done in the past. And a lot of things that could run on Dataproc in the future are inspired by Go things that Google is doing in the present to try and grow this ecosystem altogether. So let's talk about Cloud Dataproc just a little bit more specifically. So Cloud Dataproc is a way to create Spark and Hadoop clusters that are generally fast, low cost, and easy to use. And the way that we do that is we rely on a lot of the things that the Google Cloud Platform brings to the Spark and Hadoop ecosystem. And I'll talk about what things we rely on. But we've both tried to focus on making the open source components run really well and tuning some of them. And I can talk about that. Uh, but also bring a lot of the strengths of the Google Cloud Platform to open source. And the point I make here is it's not about just installing Spark and Hadoop on some servers and calling it good. Uh, there's a lot of really deep integrations, optimizations, and thought that goes into making uh, Spark and Hadoop fast, easy, and cost effective. As an example, say you want a Spark or Hadoop cluster. I started off with that really long line of having to rack servers and configure servers. But even if you don't focus on that, you still have to get the open source software and tune it and customize it and debug it. With Cloud Dataproc, we want that process to be one click. We want you to be able to fill out a very simple form and with one click, create your cluster. Cloud Dataproc is interesting, and I'll show it in my demo. We don't abstract away all of the complexities and knobs in the open source ecosystem. And in some ways, Cloud Dataproc is sort of an anti-Google Cloud product, because we do expose that messiness to you if you want it. We don't necessarily try and prevent you from doing bad things. We want you to know this is a full-on Spark and Hadoop cluster. If you want to tune specific properties or do very specific customizations, you totally can. We try and make it easy for you and optimize as much as we can for you. But with a lot of these tools, they're very knobby. 
and sometimes people want to tune and poke those knobs, and we totally let you. So if you want, you can configure your cluster, and we have a set of tools and API endpoints to try and make that very easy. So that could take 20 seconds, and by 90 seconds or so, you should have your cluster. So we go from possibly hours or days or weeks to less than three or four minutes. As I mentioned, what we're trying to do is bring the open source ecosystem to Google Cloud Platform. So we have a lot of products. And we don't want Dataproc to just be isolated, because having just Spark and Hadoop by itself isn't super useful. We want you to be able to use Spark and Hadoop with other products that we have in our platform. And I have some of them shown on this slide. For example, we want you to be able to use Spark and Hadoop with Google Cloud Storage, which is a part of the demo, as a replacement for the Hadoop distributed file system. If you want to use Bigtable, we want you to be able to use Spark and Hadoop with Bigtable. Same thing goes for BigQuery. If you're using BigQuery as an enterprise data warehouse, we want you to be able to use that powerful enterprise data warehouse with the really powerful Spark and Hadoop ecosystem. We've tried to make it very easy focusing on moving existing workloads to Cloud Dataproc. So generally, Spark and Hadoop have been out for a while. And uh, in one way or another, a lot of customers have data and workloads that they want to migrate. We don't want that migration to be painful. Generally, that migration is, should be pretty easy. You copy your data as step one to Google Cloud Storage. Step two, you should be able to change just a few lines of your job. Really, the biggest change you should need to make is just changing the URI prefix of where your data is located. Instead of being on HDFS, it's in Cloud Storage. You really shouldn't need to make any other changes than that. So moving your actual code should be very, very easy, almost as easy as just copying your data over. And then step three, you actually use Cloud Data Proc. So this is an example job. Uh, it's from the Spark examples. Um, and it's a job that is reading from HDFS. In this case, you can see, and it may be hard to see, and I apologize, uh, HDFS is just stricken, and we replaced the URI prefix with GS for Google Cloud Storage. So if I wanted to move this example job to Dataproc, that's the only change I need to make, aside from making sure that the data I'm reading uh, it exists in cloud storage and has the same file structure. So again, very, very easy to move work, because moving, moving work and recoding things is not a value add. You're not focusing on your data. and we don't, we don't really want that. Under the hood a little bit. So Cloud Data Proc is, for all intents and purposes, a Spark and Hadoop cluster. And you can create multiple clusters in a project and submit work to those clusters. Those clusters are built on existing Cloud Platform technology. So it's built on Compute Engine. Cloud Data Proc clusters have one or more master nodes. You have a set of worker nodes. And then you can create preemptible worker nodes that take advantage of preemptible VMs. Uh, for anybody that's not familiar with preemptible VMs, they're Compute Engine VMs. They're a special type. Uh, there's a trade-off. They have substantially lower cost, but they also have a maximum lifetime of 24 hours. They're basically built on spare capacity in Google data centers. And if we need that capacity back, you lose the preemptible VM. Well, preemptible VMs may be great for compute intensive workloads with Spark and Hadoop. You can use them with Cloud Data Proc. So again, we're trying to not only just rely on the lower general costs of Google Cloud Platform, but allow you to use the super low cost uh, aspects of Google Cloud Platform to bring your data processing costs down even further. Uh, clusters in Cloud Data Proc do have HDFS attached to them based on persistent disk. Uh, we generally advise customers don't actually store any type of persistent data on this because A, you don't want your persistent data to be ephemeral with your ephemeral Spark or Hadoop cluster. Um, and then B, you can actually get better performance often with Google Cloud Storage than you can with uh, HDFS that's based on persistent disk. Um, and then with your clusters, you can read and write. Generally, most customers will use Google Cloud Storage to do that. Going into a little bit more detail, Cloud Data Proc has an API, a REST API, and our client tools talk to that REST API. Um, that's the same REST API that anybody, anybody can use. Um, and the engineering team, which I have to give enormous credit to, uh, they're a very passionate group of people, and I would not be able to actually talk about Cloud Data Proc if they weren't dedicated and awesome, um, has put a lot of time and thought into making that API uh, expressive yet easy to use. Um, that API really has kind of three endpoints, one for managing clusters, one for managing jobs, and there's an API endpoint for operations. 
So on all of these compute nodes, we have a Cloud Data Proc agent, which talks to our control plane. And this is a lot, this is really how we kind of create the glue of the Spark and Hadoop cluster and allow, uh, allow for some interesting things, like being able to submit and manage work and interact with Yarn on the cluster. We build an image, it's based on Debian, and the open source components are built using another Apache project called Apache Big Top. So basically, we build our own custom uh, sort of open source distribution of the Spark and Hadoop ecosystem. Um, if you haven't used Dataproc before, the team takes great pride in making sure that we not only version all of the versions of Dataproc, so you can actually select kind of which bundle of components you want to use and their version set, uh, we also generally try to release frequently. So for example, our preview image for uh, Cloud Dataproc is based on Hadoop 2.8, uh, which is sort of late, late and breaking. Um, our production image right now uses very recent versions of both Hadoop and Spark. Um, if you want to use older versions, you can always go back and use, use older versions of Cloud Dataproc. The goal here is to allow people to use the set of versions of that they really want to and not uh, lag for weeks, months, or quarters behind, uh, but also not just put beta software on clusters and force people to dog food. So as I mentioned, all of our client tools are built on our REST API. Uh, generally, there's three client tools or three ways that people interact with clusters. There's the uh, Google Cloud Console. There's the Google Cloud SDK, uh, which is uh, often seen or known as uh, G Cloud. Uh, and then there's SSH. Since this is built on compute engines, you can interact with the compute nodes as if they were just regular VMs, because they are. So you can SSH into the master and worker nodes. Pricing. A uh, very common question for Cloud Data Proc. So with your Cloud Data Proc, excuse me, I should be able to pronounce my own product name. With your Cloud Data Proc cluster, you pay for the compute and storage charges that make up your cluster. And then there's a very low one cent premium per virtual CPU on top of that, that we charge for uh, all of the awesome things that we provide as part of Cloud Data Proc. It sounds scary, but we're actually very cost effective if you compare Cloud Data Proc to other uh, providers. The source was actually moved in this slide, and I kind of have to duck here, but it's there. It's, it's actually based on an O'Reilly uh, article. It's a comparison between uh, Amazon EMR and Cloud Data Proc. Um, and you can see, in general, Cloud Data Proc um, is, uh, runs jobs faster. That's important because we bill by the minute. We don't round up to the nearest hour. So if you use a cluster for 13 minutes, you pay for 13 minutes, not one hour. We've also really been optimizing Cloud Data Proc to make processing faster. And this is a really important point, because the goal is not to just let things stagnate. We actually want to speed up your data processing workloads. It does mean that you might use less Cloud Data Proc. And we actually see that as a victory. Uh, so this is an example of a feature which will be rolling out soon to Cloud Data Proc, where we changed out the SSL mechanism or provider used in our cloud storage connector from the default uh, implementation to one based on Google's fork of OpenSSL. Um, and you can see that reads have gotten, or will get in most cases, substantially faster. Uh, writes will also see an improvement as well. Um, and I mentioned this to really showcase, we're, we're really trying to, a goal is to have you use less data proc because you're able to do more with the same amount or with less. So the supported components, a uh, big ecosystem. There's a lot of stuff that you can run on Cloud Data Proc clusters. Uh, by default, we install the most common packages. Um, so that's Spark, Hadoop, Hive, Pig. Um, some of those packages are tricky because something like Hadoop includes, I don't know how many weird sub-projects and tangents of projects. Um, but generally, those are the four core components. Uh, we build a lot of the ecosystem, however, in BigTop. Uh, we have a repository with each release. So if you wanted to install something like uh, Zeppelin, that's built in BigTop. It's actually in BigTop. So if you went onto a cluster or you used an initialization action, which I will show you in my demo, uh, you could install Zeppelin, because we actually have pre-built it. Um, the reason I call this out, it's a very common question of how much can we install on a cluster? Well, you can install really whatever you want. We try to keep it lean because we don't want to burden clusters and install stuff that people aren't going to use and is just going to take up resources and make their data processing slower and make them sad, and then that makes us sad. So I'm going to go to a Cloud Data Proc demo to tie together some of the things that I've mentioned thus far. 
in this demo, we're going to do a few things. We are going to create a cluster. And I'm going to create a fairly sizable cluster. It's not the biggest cluster in the world, but I think it's, it's, it's you know, modestly big. Uh, we're going to query a large set of data. And I'll talk about the data and the queries that we're going to run. Uh, we're going to see the output of those queries. Uh, and that actually hints at some of the really fancy tooling around Cloud Data Proc. And then we're going to delete the cluster, just to show you that you only need the cluster that's really designed as an ephemeral solution. You only need the cluster as long as you actually have data to process. So the data that we are going to query is based on the New York taxi data set. So from 2009 to 2015, uh, New York City Limousine Taxi Commission released all taxi trips and Uber trips in New York. Uh, uncompressed, the data set is about 270 gigabytes. It's in CSV format. There's about 1.2 billion trips in this data set. So I'm going to switch here. So this is the Google Cloud Console, if you have not seen it before. And this is the form or the page to create a Cloud Data Proc cluster. Uh, I could create this cluster through just a raw API call. I could also use gcloud. I'm showing you through the Cloud Console just because it is generally the least. It's much easier to demo than trying to, to type in a console. First thing we're going to do is give the cluster a name. I'm going to call my cluster James Demo. The second thing that you generally will want to fill in is the zone where you're going to create a cluster. Uh, Cloud Data Proc is generally available wherever Compute Engine is available. Uh, that is going to be true as Compute Engine is made available in more regions uh, as Google Cloud expands. Uh, the Cloud Data Proc team wants to be available uh, everywhere that Google Cloud is available. So right now, the list is here, and the list will grow uh, over time. I'm going to choose US Central, just because I suspect that's going to give us pretty good performance since we're in the US right now. You then choose how you want to configure your master and worker nodes. And these are very analogous to traditional Hadoop master and worker nodes. Uh, for master nodes, we offer kind of three different varieties. And one of them is actually a new feature, which is having a cluster that's just one node. That means your master is your worker. Uh, good for development, exploration, possibly education, uh, lightweight data science. Uh, the default option is just having one master. We also offer the ability to have high availability, which is three masters. And that provides, uh, it's based on Zookeeper, and it provides YARN and HDFS high availability. I'm just going to create a standard cluster here because we don't need high availability. You can choose the machine type that you want to use in your cluster. Um, in the web UI here, we have all of the standard uh, non-shared CPU machine types. You can also use custom VMs with Cloud Data Proc. So if you actually wanted to use a machine type that was based on six CPUs and 58.62 gigabytes of RAM, you could absolutely do that uh, through the API and the command line. Um, in this case, I'm just going to choose an N1 standard 16 for my master node. And worker nodes, same thing. Uh, something that is worth calling out here um, is in the very near future, uh, Cloud Data Proc will be supporting uh, 64 core VMs, um, which were recently announced uh, on beta on Google Cloud Platform. Um, and I call that out because often a lot of the improvements that are made to the underlying services of Cloud Platform, whether it's Compute Engine or Cloud Storage or networking, Cloud Data Proc benefits from those. So as a lot of other components in Google Cloud get better, it means that using Spark and Hadoop gets incrementally better as well. For my worker nodes, I'm going to use an 8-core uh, N1 standard 8 just in our testing. These work usually pretty well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and create kind of a modestly large cluster here. Let's go ahead and add 200 nodes. Uh, that'll give us 1,600 yarn cores and about 4.7 terabytes of yarn RAM. Um, we're not going to use a lot of HDFS, so I'm actually going to lower the amount of, of persistent disk that we attach, because we're not really going to be writing uh, to HDFS. And then you can see there's some advanced options that are optional uh, that you can configure. I could do things like use networking. And Google, uh, Cloud Data Proc supports a wide variety of networking options. Uh, you can select, as I mentioned, different versions of Cloud Data Proc. Um, in this case, the configuration I'm going to apply is I'm really going to, the, the one to notice, I'm going to install uh, Presto on my cluster, just to show you that you can install a wide variety of things on Cloud Data Proc. And Presto is actually not part of the sort of Apache big data ecosystem, but I'm going to install it and show you that it works. And we're going to run all of our queries through Presto, actually. So we'll go ahead and create that cluster. All right. So the cluster is in the process of uh, bootstrapping itself. Let's go ahead and fill out the form to submit our job. 
Now, with Cloud Data Proc, one of the things that we've paid a lot of attention to is trying to make it really easy to interact with your cluster. And often when you want to submit work, uh, in this case we call them jobs, to clusters, you have to use kind of complicated tooling or you have to like log in and open an SSH window, um, and that's just no good. If, you're, if you have a lot of work to do, we want it to be very easy for you to submit your Spark or PySpark or Spark SQL scripts to Cloud Data Proc. The other thing that I'll show you here is the Jobs API and the tools on top of it allow us to not only submit work, but we can actually see the streamed output from those jobs. And the nice thing is, is I could actually submit the job and close my computer and throw it in a fire, and that job is still going to run. So it's not tied to the persistence of that one computer, which is actually a really annoying problem if you use Spark and Hadoop a lot, that you open up a terminal window, and if that terminal window goes away, unless you thought about it, that job is going to just vanish when you, when you uh, leave your computer. So first thing, I'm going to choose the cluster that I want to run the job on. The next thing I'm going to do is choose the job type. Uh, right now, we support six job types. Um, I'm going to run pig, and people always give me a hard time about this, but there's a very good reason. Um, the reason I'm going to use pig is because I'm going to abuse pig. Um, I'm actually just going to use pig to shell out to call presto. A little convoluted, but it's convoluted on purpose to show you that we're not putting up like bumpers or guardrails. You can do really whatever you want. Uh, the goal here is to allow you to have uh, life be very easy. So for example, if I wanted to just run Spark SQL, uh, I could enter a file uh, with my Spark SQL in cloud storage, or just the raw query text. Like, very easy. Um, and me using pig to shell out to Presto, that's a bit more complicated and interesting. Um, but that's really to show you that if you want to develop with Spark and Hadoop, we're not going to try and artificially limit you and constrain you uh, too much. So with my pig script here, I am going to specify my query file. Uh, which is inside of a cloud storage bucket. Um, and this SQL script is going to essentially just query Presto uh, with a few queries. Let's go take a look at the cluster that we created. I was talking a little bit. Um, unfortunately, and just blabbering a lot, my cluster actually was ready probably two minutes ago. So our 200 node uh, cluster with 1,600 cores is ready to go. Uh, all of the VMs are up, and it's ready to take work. Um, if I wanted to, I can edit this cluster and do things like add and remove uh, worker nodes. I can add and remove preemptible nodes. Um, so, and that's while the cluster is running. So if I wanted to add more nodes to this cluster while it was running, I totally can. And just because it sounds like fun, let's go ahead and do that. So let's submit our job. And the job is now running on my cluster. And as the job gets started, you'll actually see the job output start spooling here live to the screen. So you can actually see that uh, first thing that's going to happen if you have really good eyesight is we're going to create an uh, external table and then start running queries against that external table. This is an example of us trying to make life easy for you. So the job was sent to the cluster. We're interacting with open source components and feeding the output back to you. Job's running. Let's go ahead and say, oh, I'm worried about this job. Let's go ahead and add you know, 20 more nodes or 10 more nodes just because we want a really big cluster. So. We're going to go ahead and update the cluster while the job is running. It's not going to impact the job at all. And you can see that the job is starting to spool output to this screen live. Um, it's going to update the same. You'd have the same experience if you used the gcloud command. Uh, so if you said gcloud data proc job submit uh, pig and then fed it the required arguments, you're going to see this uh, output to the, the screen as well. Um, this job is not writing anything anywhere. It's really just emitting the results um, in, in standard out. You obviously could save results back to you know, BigQuery or cloud storage or a number of other uh, cloud products. You can see that while the cluster is resizing, uh, it doesn't go down. There's no interruption of service. It just continues to work without hassle, uh, without you needing to do anything uh, much more specific than that. So will that job, oh, OK, I was going to actually start talking again. But we just went and queried all of that data. Uh, it took a minute and 33 seconds. What's really impressive about that is this data is in cloud storage. So between cloud storage, where this giant data set is stored, and the Spark and Hadoop cluster, uh, it was able to read the data and query it 
in one minute and 33 seconds. And that's really because there's really fast networking between, well, in our data centers in general, and the Cloud Data Proc cluster is able to use that really fast networking to go query cloud storage in a Jiffy. So actually, we're just done with this cluster. Uh, that's really what I wanted to show. So let's go ahead and say, we're done. We actually don't need this cluster anymore. We'll just go ahead and delete that cluster, and the cluster is going to go away. No fuss, no hassle. So what happened? We created a cluster that was 1,600 yarn cores. Uh, it ran the Spark and Hadoop ecosystem. In this case, we took advantage of Presto, and we did it in one click. Uh, to put a little bit more detail in what we did, uh, we created an external table that was based on the data in the cloud storage bucket. And then we just ran a few simple queries against that data. Uh, these aren't the most complicated queries in the world, but it is reading a substantial portion of the data from cloud storage uh, using Presto. Ultimately, um, and I've run this demo enough and run the costs uh, on all these different clouds, um, we didn't have this cluster for longer than 10 minutes. So we're going to actually be charged the 10 minute minimum for cloud data proc. Everything beyond 10 minutes is per minute. Uh, that 210 node cluster costs $12.85 to run. Uh, if you ran it in uh, Amazon EMR or HD Insight, uh, you'd be paying substantially more, respectively, uh, just based on either hour rounding or just more expensive costs uh, on a per minute basis overall. So I've told you Dataproc is awesome. Uh, we have some just kind of random, uh, random quotes from Twitter. Uh, if you don't believe me, you can search Twitter. These are definitely there. Um, we've had both customers offload from other clouds to Dataproc uh, or from on-premise to Dataproc. Um, and we've really tried to focus on customer feedback to make Dataproc better. That's a core part of how we improve the platform overall. Um, ultimately, we also try to share best practices with customers to make using data proc easier. And I want to share kind of some of those tips with you. So if you are interested in using Spark and Hadoop on cloud platform, or you are using cloud data proc already, uh, you have a better experience. Uh, the first tip that we recommend to a lot of customers is to split clusters and jobs. Canonically on premise, you most often will have one cluster, and everybody will just submit all of their jobs to that cluster. And they may try and do it intelligently and submit their jobs over time or schedule them, or they may just submit all of the jobs and see what happens. With Cloud Data Proc, you can have multiple clusters, and the clusters can be right-sized and shaped and uh, conditioned and configured to run specific types of jobs. So if I have a bunch of jobs and my first two jobs uh, run pretty quickly and I know I can run them in parallel, I can send them off to cluster A. If I have two slower jobs that are very intensive and I want them to run separately, you can run them on separate clusters. Um, we also support the use of cloud labels with Cloud Data Proc. Uh, labels are a, key, a value, key value pair that you can associate with uh, cloud resources. With Cloud Data Proc, that's really important because if I have these three different clusters and I wanted to tag maybe organization equals A, B, and C, I can then do cost accounting and billing accounting based on those labels and actually filter and list by those labels separately. So if you are running Spark and Hadoop in an enterprise setting and you actually wanted to do something like be able to figure out how much people were using or trace that back, uh, labels make it very easy. And splitting clusters and jobs makes it very easy. And labels can apply to both Cloud Data Proc clusters and jobs. Development and production. Um, if you need to have a production and development environment, you want to have maybe a staging environment, since you can have multiple clusters, it's very easy to have separate prod, dev, test, whatever, experimentation clusters. You just create a new cluster. Nice thing here is if, for example, you wanted to do some development and you didn't want to break or impact other users or other jobs, just create a development cluster. Uh, additionally, since you can read data, for instance, from cloud storage from multiple different clusters. If I wanted to have all of my production work occurring and then do some development, maybe I have a bunch of Spark and I want to test it in Spark 2.2. You can create a new cluster, use a preview image, and start testing against that cloud storage bucket. You don't have to do anything differently. You don't have to copy data. It's very easy to do. And we've had a lot of success trying to help customers migrate to the idea that you can create clusters when you need them. And if you don't need them, you can delete them. Uh, there's really no reason, honestly, to, I would advocate, if you're not using a cluster, delete it. Uh, we don't want you to keep it around. We don't, that's not good for you. Um, and ultimately, that just makes it not good for us. So create and delete clusters often. 
Um, if you have a bunch of work and you want to schedule creating and deleting clusters, uh, you can. Um, as an example, if you are using something like Apache Airflow, you can actually create cloud data proc clusters, run your jobs uh, using Apache Airflow, and then delete your cluster. Uh, great example of an ephemeral use case where you can create and delete clusters often just based on whenever you actually need them. Cloud storage. A lot of people that shift from on-premise to, uh, to cloud data proc ask us, you know, what's the performance of cloud storage? How does it compare with HDFS? Why should I use cloud storage? Generally speaking, cloud storage is going to give you a very high throughput. Uh, it has its own sets of features, which you may find really useful, like being able to apply security controls or having auditing on cloud storage buckets. It also allows you to use data in cloud storage between many different Google Cloud products. So you could do like federated queries with BigQuery on that cloud storage bucket. So moving away from HDFS not only brings performance and cost benefits for your Spark and Hadoop use cases, but it may provide a lot of other benefits for data that would normally have just been living in HDFS, because that's where it would live. The job submission API. Uh, if you are submitting work to your clusters, I mean, you can submit work really many different ways. There's probably an infinite number of ways when you look at it to submit work. You could SSH in and use Spark Submit. Uh, you could use something like Airflow. You could write a Python script that's sitting on a cron tab, just submitting work whenever you, know, whenever you have it scheduled. Um, generally, we advocate that you use our job submission API, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It allows you to do things like apply labels to jobs. Uh, as you saw, you can see the output from jobs. Um, it makes it much easier, so you only have to fill in a few arguments to actually submit work to a cluster. So with the job API, we've really tried to make it easy for you to broker work and interact with work and manage work uh, with clusters. So as I've sort of shown you and, and talked about, uh, you can scale clusters at any time. Uh, we scaled the cluster in the demo. Um, as I mentioned, I didn't demo it, but you can use custom VM types for your master and worker nodes. Uh, and you can use preemptible nodes with your clusters if, uh, if you want to use uh, preemptible nodes. One thing that I ran to install Presto is what I called an initialization action. Uh, initialization actions are scripts which can be interpreted on the cluster. So these could be shell scripts, they could be Python scripts, they could be Ruby scripts. These scripts are run uh, after the services start on the cluster. They're really useful for doing things like staging jars or copying data locally that you might want to test on, or in this case, as we saw, uh, installing Presto. We also have a mechanism through our client tooling to allow you to set properties in cluster files. So if you wanted to modify, say, properties in the core site XML file, we have a way for you to easily do that. So you don't have to go in and SSH in or write an initialization action to do it. So we've tried to create two really powerful but easy ways for you to customize clusters uh, when you start them up. There is a bunch of new Cloud Data Proc features that I want to talk about uh, that we've released kind of in the last few weeks in anticipation for next. Um, we've actually gotten a few more out that I, uh, I can talk about as well. Um, the first is restartable jobs. So in our job uh, API and our client tooling, traditionally, when a job ran and failed, that was sort of it. The job would just sit and have failed. Um, in some cases, this may not be desirable. You actually may want a job to restart. Uh, for example, you may have a streaming job that just runs out of memory, and it was a kind of a corner case, and you want that job to restart. With our client tooling now, when you submit a job to Cloud Data Proc, you can actually specify the number of times per hour that you want that job to restart. This is really useful for long-running jobs. Uh, we designed it with kind of an eye on streaming applications as we look to better support and provide support for streaming applications on Data Proc. Uh, so that way, you can be confident that if your work fails, we're going to re-kick off that job for you. GPUs were recently announced on Cloud Platform and made available to Compute Engine. Uh, this is a good example of when innovations occur uh, on other parts of the Cloud Platform, if they make sense to bring to the Spark and Hadoop ecosystem. We absolutely want to. So when you create Cloud Data Proc clusters now, you can specify the number of accelerators, uh, which are essentially GPUs, uh, that you want attached to either your master or worker nodes in your cluster, from zero, which is the default, um, up to eight. Um, the, you know, if, if, if anybody is really interested in GPUs in Spark, I think you would probably know this is an evolving ecosystem. And I think the Spark support and kind of other uh, of ecosystem support for GPUs is an evolving story. Um, but there's a lot of cases where you actually may want to use GPUs now or in the future, and it was very important to us to allow you to uh, use them with Cloud Data Proc as soon as possible. 
I had briefly mentioned single node clusters. Um, a common request that we had from customers was they wanted to just run very small tests, and they actually didn't need a full-blown cluster. So they just wanted to run a really quick test using Spark. They wanted to do really lightweight data science. With single node clusters, you create a cluster which is just one node. It's the master and worker node. That way, you don't have to create a full-blown Spark and Hadoop cluster. Because uh, for something like if you're teaching somebody how you're leading a class, for example, on how to use Spark, you don't need giant clusters to do that. You actually just need probably a small-ish VM that has Spark installed. And with single node clusters, we've really tried to make it easy for you to create these lightweight clusters for experimentation and development. Regional endpoints and private IP addresses. So with Cloud Data Proc, when we launched almost a year ago, our API um, and the client tools that used our API uh, used one region, which was global. Uh, recently, we've added uh, individual regions for each compute engine region in Cloud Data Proc. So in our API and via our client tools, you can now isolate to a specific region. So you could say, uh, if you're using our tools, say, keep every, you know, use the US region. That means the calls are going to that region. Um, we've distributed our control plane, and essentially we've stood up individual stacks of uh, the control infrastructure for Cloud Data Proc in all of these individual regions. The benefit there is you may get better performance. Uh, so for example, if you are in Europe uh, and you wanted to use the Europe region, you may get much better performance by isolating to that region for uh, applications that are working entirely in Europe. Clusters and cloud resources have uh, going to private IPs. Clusters and resources have often had public IPs attached to them. Uh, one very, very common request from large enterprise customers especially was, I want clusters, but I don't want them to have a public IP attached, because that makes my security people very sad face. Uh, so with the recent launch of CloudPath uh, last week, uh, we now support creating clusters that do not have a public IP attached to them. Um, and an important differentiator here is we try and make it very easy. So it's not, you know, this isn't something that's unique to Dataproc, but the way that we've tried to innovate and make life better for all Google Cloud customers here is to make it very easy to create clusters that don't have a public IP attached to them. Um, both of these features are in beta, and, um, you know, they're, they, they were both commonly requested features, and that drives back to uh, we try to respond to customer feedback. So honestly, if you are interested in using data proc or you are and you have ideas, requests, gripes, loves, complaints, you know, send them our way. We try to be very, very customer focused and hands on. How to get started with Cloud Data Proc. There's a few different sessions which uh, either directly or indirectly mention uh, Cloud Data Proc. Um, some of these sessions have unfortunately already passed, but the good news is, is I believe the videos will be on YouTube. Um, so if you are interested, uh, this was kind of the most to, to level set. This is really just kind of the introduction to a lot of these concepts. A lot of these other tools go into very specific ideas and concepts. Uh, if you want to get hands-on literally right now, there's a ton of code labs um, downstairs. You can get started with Cloud Data Proc code labs. Uh, we also have a set of quick starts and tutorials to show you how to create clusters and submit jobs. Um, and just to sort of go back to the initialization actions, uh, a lot of what we do that's customer facing, that's uh, open source, we have uh, in various GitHub repositories. So we have our initialization actions, for example, for installing like Zeppelin and Presto there. If you need help, there's many different ways that you can get help with Cloud Data Proc. Uh, we have documentation online. Uh, we also have our release notes. Um, I, again, have to give the engineering team credit here. Uh, we release updates to Cloud Data Proc fairly frequently, uh, which we really take pride in, because we're trying to bring the latest and greatest of this large ecosystem with a ton of innovations to make it better. Um, so if you have been or are interested in data proc, watch our release notes pretty closely because they usually will change about every week for the better. Um, if you actually want you know, hands-on help, a really good place is Stack Overflow using the Google Cloud data proc tag. Uh, you can probably indirectly meet many members of the uh, Cloud data proc team based on just answers from Stack Overflow. Um, and then we have uh, our informal email list and if you are a Google Cloud Support customer, that's also an option as well. And with that, uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to take that. Other than that, uh, thank you guys very much.